Good evening, everybody. We welcome you to the Psi Upsilon Spring Program. And we understand that many of our uh, members of our nursing family uh, have been very busy and have other activities going on. So we're excited to be recording this program so that you can watch it at a time that is convenient for you. My name is Carol Lisk, and I'm the president of Psi Upsilon Chapter. And we also are welcoming uh, guests and members from the Lambda Mu uh, chapter, Marcus's alma mater, uh, at the University of Louisiana at Monroe. So at this time, I would like to first thank Michelle Miller, who's serving as the uh, facilitator for our event this evening. And I'd like to uh, turn it over to Michelle to introduce our presenter, Dr. Marcus Scott. Good evening. I'm so glad y'all could join us this evening. And I have the great pleasure of introducing um, our guest speaker tonight. Dr. Gott currently lives in Mississippi with his wife, three children, one grandson, and we can't forget his precious uh, miniature schnauzer. Uh, I am so impressed when I read Dr. Gott's bio. Uh, I will highlight some of those roles that he has played, not only in nursing, but in his service to both his community and our country. Uh, Dr. Gott was born in, um, to an Army family, and that's not surprising that he was born in Germany. And then what may be a little bit surprising is that he only weighed two pounds and five ounces when he was born. But uh, to put this in perspective, that's like a two-slice toaster. Now, don't go out and grab your toaster right now, because you're going to see that his weight at birth has not held him back one bit. Dr. Gott served his community as a lay minister with the United Methodist Church and specialization in parish nursing. So he's given back time and time again. He is also certified by the American Accreditation Center in uh, faith community nursing. In his course, he is a course instructor with uh, Western Governor University, and where he serves to support students toward their master's degree in nursing leadership and management. His love for nursing actually began as a nursing assistant, and this led him into his um, following his parents in their footsteps as he was in the Army and served as a combat medic. So being raised in Shreveport, Louisiana, he returned to the University of Louisiana at Monroe, where he got his bachelor's degree in nursing. He moved to his master's degree in nursing, which focused on uh, health care systems management. And uh, he got his doctorate in nursing practice with a dual major in administration and nursing education. I am so proud to welcome Dr. Gott to the, uh, a night to present to you. All right. Well, thank you for that warm and wonderful introduction. I certainly look forward to sharing with everyone on this evening. Again, uh, certainly I do not mind going by Marcus for we're all friends here. But I look forward to sharing with you today about a practice model supportive of diverse populations in faith, community, and nursing. Uh, so let us jump right on in. I do want to share that there are a couple of outcomes that I uh, would like to see us complete or accomplish this evening. Uh, the first is that we would identify the complexities of faith-based holistic care within diverse communities. And a second outcome is that we will be able to describe a conceptual model supportive of the diverse practice within faith community nursing. Now, if you would allow me to take a moment, allow me to offer to you a definition of faith-based care. Faith-based care, for purposes of our sharing, embraces and reflects the spiritual belief systems and practices of the recipient of care. So this is opposed to faith-placed care which would be care located within a faith community void of spiritual intentionality. I'll give you this example. If I were to partner with a community of faith and just host a health fair, for example, that may very well be a faith-placed uh, care event. But if in the hosting of that health fair, 
the clergy were involved and readings from the sacred text and prayers, certain spiritual practices that reflect their specific belief system, then that would make that a faith-based care event and opportunity. So it's important that we understand the differences, if you will, between the faith-based and faith-placed care for this model embraces a faith-based holistic care approach. So let us continue. Let's talk a bit about the complexities of faith and community. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I've asked myself this question a few times over the years, just how many faiths are there in the world? Well, <clears throat> I've come to believe in this day and age that if you can't find it on Google or YouTube, it's just not meant to be found. <laughs> but jokes aside, if you were to Google the question, how many faiths are there in the world, you'd find that it suggested that there's 4,300 faiths or faith traditions or religions in the world. Now, if you Google faith, you would find a definition to be complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And depending upon where one finds himself or herself or their client with respect to the 4,300 different faiths or religions of the world, faith can mean a multitude of things. Let us consider, for example, there may be a nurse or a client who would suggest that I trust science that I am confident in the ability of science to affirm and answer all things. And yet another individual might suggest that I trust God. I am confident in the ability of God to affirm and answer all things. And yet another would suggest I trust the universe. I am confident in the ability of the universe to affirm and answer all things. And yet another might trust themselves. They might suggest to you in the provision of care or even the receipt of care that I trust me. I believe in me and my ability to affirm and answer all things. So when we consider those complexities, when we consider the, excuse me, the 4,300 different faith traditions, examples of those may persist as Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, Atheism, Judaism, Confucianism, Shinto, any number as we seek to identify those 43 persons will fall along that continuum of faith, believing in something. Well, faith community nursing recognizes the university, the universality of spirituality and it seeks to reconcile and support an individual's experience with health and spirituality. And this reconciliatory work reflects the spirituality and or faith of the nurse and the client. And so we must come to understand that adherence to faith traditions in which faith community nurses provide care are not the same. Each adherent experiences and expresses their faith in different ways. And these differences, they give us insight into the complexities that impact the provision of faith-based holistic care. Consider this. I'll, I'll just share a little bit of my story. It has been shared that I'm a certified lay minister in the United Methodist Church with specialization in parish nursing, but I've also served as a pastor in the United Methodist Church. But more specifically, in my current faith tradition and faith practice, my family and I are the only African Americans that belong to our United Methodist Church family located in the southern portion of the United States, in Mississippi nonetheless. So I ask you, as we consider the diversity of experience and diversity of faith traditions, how might you describe the complexities of my providing spiritual care within the diverse community in which I serve? Let's give that a thought. Again, complexities of faith and complexities of community. So let's, let's take a grander look at things as we can consider further the complexities of care provided by faith community nurses. We must consider that those complexities 
are complemented, for lack of a better description, by the varied worldviews that inform and guide the lived experiences of the faith community nurse and the individuals, families, and communities and populations that she or he serves. There have been no less than one dozen synonyms for worldview provided in the literature and in our experiences. Those synonyms include cognitive maps, ethos, forms of life, world hypothesis, and climate of opinion. Yes, there are many ways in which we might conceptualize worldview. Webster suggests the worldview to be the way someone thinks about the world or a comprehensive conception or apprehension of the world, especially from a specific standpoint. So given the variety of experiences lived by those who gather this evening and those who will share in this recording, one might argue that each of us represents an individual worldview. So might we consider that the experiences of diverse communities sometimes reflect a shared worldview? Consider communities that experience persecution or injustice. Consider health disparities as they exist in your community. Would you concede that a shared communal worldview may persist that impacts your ability to practice? Generally speaking, nurses are middle class citizens who may embrace a worldview or experience lives that differ from the residents of the communities they serve. Communities that may very well lack equitable access to health care and resources. Research suggests to us, and even our lived experiences, suggest to us that there is an increasing gulf between the wealthy and the poor, that the middle class is shrinking, and that there are increasing numbers of working poor. An international view of economics would suggest that poverty is on the rise and that the burden of poverty increasingly impacts the health care facilitated by faith community nurses who may have insurance and employment independent of their service or ministry. So let's consider a few examples of worldviews. Uh, Dennis McCallum suggests that there are five major worldviews that capture the world's religions and philosophies. Now, considering our previous slide, considering what we previously shared, and the examples we are about to discuss, one might deduce that worldview is both an individual experience and a cultural phenomenon. The five worldviews identified by McCallum are naturalism, pantheism, theism, spiritism, and polytheism, and postmodernism. When we think about naturalism, consider religions or belief systems or persons who have the faith that would be described as atheist, agnostic, or existentialist. As we consider a pantheistic worldview, the religions that might be grouped in that particular worldview include Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, and much of what would be described as New Age consciousness. A theistic worldview would include religious systems to include Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And then there is spiritism and polytheism, which the names kind of lend themselves to, to the groupings, and then postmodernism. And each of these worldviews posits views on reality, man, truth, and values. But I'd like to add a sixth option, a sixth worldview, and that is humanism, because I believe that we are most familiar with its impact upon our lives, lived as it is commonly expressed within the sciences, even the science of nursing. The American Humanist Association Observe, offers several definitions of humanism, and they suggest humanism to be a rational philosophy informed by science, inspired by art, and motivated by compassion. 
A democratic and ethical lifestyle which affirms that human beings have the right and the responsibility to give meaning and shape to their own lives. A joyous alternative to religions that believe in a supernatural God and life in a hereafter. And so it is that amidst the various worldviews and or categories, one would find a diverse experience of expression. Consider the Messianic Jew who practices Judaism and accepts the Christian assertion that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Or consider the atheist who, like the New Age believer, has faith in the power of humans helping humans. Yes, there is diversity of faith and there is diversity of community all around us, and it is in this context that faith community nurses practice. Well, we would be remiss not to discuss the complexities of nursing. You know, one of the things I love and celebrate about nursing is the diversity of experiences one can have. Tired of a practice environment? Try a new one. I myself began my career as a staff nurse on a cardiovascular intervention unit. And I've had the pleasure of working upon medical surgical units, telemetry units, neuro, neuro ortho, and I was even blessed with the opportunity to be on the team of professionals that opened a school-based health center in an underprivileged and underperforming school district. And I have taught and served as an administrator, an associate, baccalaureate, and graduate nursing education program. And yes, I have worked with many a different nurse and many a different student nurse who, who have developed their own practice preferences from different theoretical approaches and for different personal reasons. I've worked with nurses and student nurses who, whose family history included nurses and healthcare providers. And nurses who, like me, were first generation college students with no history of healthcare providers in their family. Yes, nursing is diverse, and I like it. However, the complexities that nursing embraces, complexities that include our discussions around educational preparation, complexities that include our discussions around theoretical approaches to care, or how to engage in spiritual assessment and holistic care, complexities that include the impact of worldview upon our practice, the complexities that nursing embraces can be both celebrated and lamented at the same time. But it is my hope that a holistic embrace of our diversity will actually promote our unity. So having considered a number of worldviews, let us now focus upon the nursing paradigm as a, prof a professional worldview. A meta paradigm has been defined as the most global perspective of a discipline. So consider nursing, if you will, let us consider nursing as a person with a worldview, and let us consider the meta paradigm as that person, as nurses' worldview. And as such, conceptual models and theories have been developed to clarify views upon the abstract concepts of the meta paradigm which are person, environment, health, and nursing. You know, models used to support the specialty practice of faith community nurses include Mary D. Naylor's transitional care model and the faith community nurse transitional care model. However, the literature suggests a dearth of evidence identifying a conceptual model and theories with an intentional focus upon faith and the faith community. And so I've developed the Tree of Life model of faith-based living, and I offer it as a practice model for faith community nurses and a conceptual model to yield faith-based practice and theory. And I present to you now the Tree of Life model of faith-based living. I'll refer to it as the Tree of Life. And so the Tree of Life suggests that the concepts of the nursing meta paradigm are expressions of and experiences with faith and community. 
The Tree of Life accommodates the application and assessment of varied interdisciplinary and intradisciplinary theoretical approaches to the care of individuals, families, and communities. The Tree of Life supports interdisciplinary, intradisciplinary, faith-based, and culturally sensitive interventions aimed at supporting individualized living and individualized nursing within faith communities. Further, the Tree of Life suggests that nursing is a shared experience between a person, nurse, and faith community that supports health as an expression of faith. A person is, in, is individually living and dying in relationship with a faith community. The suggestion is that health is defined as a faith-based, person-centered state of holism expressed in relationship with a higher being or consciousness, even a creator. And lastly, the tree of life identifies the environment as the totality of creation expressed by and interacting with the faith community. And so as you look at the image, you'll find that there is soil, that there are roots, there's a tree, of course, and then there are the leaves. Now, I will make no claim to be an artist by any stretch of the imagination, so that I hope you can see in this image all of that which I have just uh, expressed, but the soil, the roots, the tree, and the leaves. And when we look at the leaves, when we consider the leaves, let us understand that they represent observable manifestations of health. In other words, healthy leaves demonstrate beauty and evidence physical, psychological, emotional, and or spiritual health. The tree represents the individual. And it is the tree, it is the individual that is living and dying as an expression of the need for community along the continuum of life. The roots of the tree represent dimensions of influence, which are biological, psychological, sociocultural, environmental, and political economic in nature, dimensions of influence. And as components of the tree, the roots, the dimensions of influence, serve to categorize the ways in which the individual experiences life and is impacted by the lived experience within the context of local, national, and global faith communities. The contextual interactions between the individual and faith community, i.e. the activities of living, are represented by the soil. We might understand it this way. We all live, we all move, and we all have our being within community. It is within community that we breathe, that we communicate, that we eat and drink, that we eliminate, that we're working and playing, that we embrace personal cleansing and dressing, it is within community that we engage these activities of living, and the interpretation and impact upon our health is determined by how we filter and or prioritize these actions through the dimensions of influence, biologically, socioculturally, etc., and how we do this across our lifespan. See, the health of the tree is impacted by both the decisions of the tree and the impact of the community and the health of the tree is seen in the leaves, even the fruit that it bears. So there are some assumptions that accompany this tree of life model of faith-based living. Assumptions that include that there is a creator and that humankind lives in relationship with the creator and creation. A second assumption is that health is a function of faith and a product of faith-filled living. A third and final assumption is that the human body, even the human experience, is complex and best understood when viewed holistically and in community.
So as a practice model, we've got to consider how we might apply this model to our various practices. You see, the Tree of Life accommodates a variety of worldviews, and it makes room for each individual patient or client and each individual faith community nurse. It accommodates intra- and interdisciplinary approaches to care that assist the patient and the nurse in assessing self and spirituality. And it should be noted here that the literature has been suggesting to us for years, and even our own practice may affirm, that nurses have difficulty providing spiritual care. So consider this. We may place different values upon eating and drinking, but how we value it individually and collectively impacts your health. And it impacts my health as we share in this lived experience that is health. You see, the Tree of Life accommodates a patient-centered, multidisciplinary approach to the application of the nursing process. So let's explore that just a little further. We may all recall these phases of the nursing process, assessment, planning, implementation and evaluation. And yes, I still do I cringe a little <laughs> when I think about care plans, but they are so uh, supportive of competent and quality practice. But when we think about assessment and we, we, we consider that phase within the tree of life, it is during the assessment phase that the tree of life suggests that one must clarify her or his understanding of the assessment findings and discern agreement with the client. It can't be about us. It's got to be a shared experience with the client. The assessment would aim to identify relationships that exist between at least two activities of living, at least two elements of the soil, the community, the existence. It would aim to identify relationships that exist between at least two activities of living, and these relationships would become the foundation upon which the client and the nurse would establish a plan of care. As we consider the planning phase, it is during the planning phase that the tree of life suggests this question be answered by the client. What would you do or like to do? And the planning would be developed and reflect consideration of each of the dimensions of influence. So again, the question is of the client, what would you do or like to do? I'll share with you this example. You may be working with a client who's hypertensive and needs to reduce their sodium intake, but they absolutely love laced potato chips. And they remember the slogan and they subscribe to the fact that I just can't eat just one. I can't eat just one. Not just one chip, I can't eat just one bag. And so we may look at that client, that patient, and say, but you've got to cut it out. But I submit to you that we'll be less than successful with resting with that assertion, and we will be more successful in working with the client and suggesting, okay, we need to reduce your sodium intake. How do we do that? What would you do or like to do in an effort to reduce the sodium intake? And honestly, that patient may not want to, and how do we reconcile that reality? Implementation. During the implementation phase, the faith community nurse would assist the client in answering this question. How would you implement the plan? So again, having asked what you would do or what you would like to do, we now ask, how would you implement the plan? And the faith community nurse would come alongside the client as an educator, as an educator and, and the many roles in which the nurses would play, but the nurse would come alongside the client to, quote, work the plan. Given the strengths and weaknesses of both the client and the nurse in community, I suggest to nurses, I suggest to students all the time that as nurses, we tend to want to save the world. We see the problem and we try to address it with one failed swoop. But the tree of life gives us an opportunity to realize that in the context of the world, as it centers around a patient, there are both strengths and weaknesses experienced by the client 
the nurse, and the community, and you've got to work within those strengths and weaknesses to develop and implement a plan that is driven by the patient. And finally, the evaluation. During the evaluation phase, one would ask the patient or the client, how would you know if the plan worked? How would you know if the plan worked? So I wanted to take some time to share with you a case study. And we're going to share a little bit about Mr. James. And I just want to give you a moment to, to prepare your mind so that you can embrace what will be shared. And then we'll, we'll walk through how one might apply the Tree of Life model of faith-based living to the case of Mr. James. And I want to preface this, this case study. This case study has been published with, with this work, but I want you to receive this case study even within our current context. I would like for you to receive this case study understanding that there may be a Mr. James next door to you, or there may be many more Mr. Jameses in our communities, given our current reality. So let's share a bit about Mr. James. Kelvin James is a 68-year-old African-American male. He has been a member of your faith community since his birth, and until recently has been actively involved in the life of the faith community. Mr. James cannot read and does not trust doctors. As a result of chronic illnesses to include hypertension, diabetes, and obesity, Mr. James suffered a stroke six months ago. He has difficulty speaking and an inability to use the right side of his body. He is a widow of five years, and his adult children are unable to return home. Very, 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 very. <laughs> Mr. James has shared with you that he feels lonely, like less than a man, and that he is not sure if the faith community can help him. As a member of the faith community, how would you assist Mr. James? And I realize that as you listen and as you experience this case study, you may have asked yourself, what would it mean for Mr. James to be a member of my faith community? Mr. James does not look like me. Mr. James cannot read. Mr. James is not as educated as our faith community. And yet, in this case study, he is a member of your faith community. And so let's consider these realities as we walk through the tree of life in application to the life of Kelvin James. So using the tree of life model of faith-based living, we would complete or consider the following. We ask ourselves, what do we know or what, we, what would we like to know? We know that Mr. James is a widow. We know that Mr. James has suffered a stroke and he's unable to use the right side of his body. His children cannot be there to support him. And he doesn't feel as though the church can help him, so maybe he feels a little lonely and isolated. If we're going to choose a minimum of two activities of living to guide our assessment and to lead us into gaps, we might look at activities of living. We may ask questions around what do we know or what would we like to know around Mr. James's ability to engage in personal cleansing and dressing. What would we like to know, or what do we know, about his ability to communicate? Expressing sexuality, eating and drinking. What do we know, or what would we like to know? Questions we'd have to engage. And as we engage those questions and we find those answers and the assessment 
manifest data and information for us to work upon and we partner with Mr. James, we then ask ourselves, well then what do, what do you want to do, Mr. James? What would you like to do? And as we consider what is to be done, we've got to walk through those dimensions of influence. We've got to consider that even with his uh, comorbidities, even with his chronic illnesses, there are biological implications that may impact his ability to do or may force him to not be able to do. We've got to consider the psychological dimension of influence, the psychological filtering. Whatever it is that we may share with Mr. James in terms of recommended uh, care or resources, we've got to consider psychologically that his worldview may differ from ours. His, may, his worldview may differ from yours. His worldview, we already know, suggests a distrust of doctors and so changes in diet, but Mr. James may say to you, we're all going to die, so why should I change anything? And so as we consider those psych that psychological dimension of influence, we've got to understand that there may be disagreement between Dr. I'm sorry, Mr. James and you as the nurse, but that doesn't make him wrong. It just presents for an opportunity for us to find further some way to agree on what he would like to do, understanding that at some point along the continuum, of, along the life, across the lifespan, along the continuum of life, somewhere Mr. James may change his mind and change his approach. But right now, we've also got to consider sociocultural. I share with you that my family and I are the only African-American members of our church in Mississippi. Well, if Mr. James is a member of your church and he happens to be the only African-American member of your church, how do you meet Mr. James in recognizing and learning of the social cultural needs and nuances? I can tell you now that um, I realize that there are some things that I probably should not eat. But if I were to gather at my grandmother's house for any given holiday, if she cooks it, I'm eating it. Moreover, my maternal grandmother, I'm her oldest grandson. And if I were to call her in the middle of the summer, she would cook as if it were Thanksgiving. My point is this. As we consider sociocultural nuances, we must not discount those things that have value and meaning to our patients even when we don't understand or agree. And then, of course, there are environmental uh, dimensions of influence, uh, the environmental dimension of influence. Well, we must consider what is the environmental impact upon these things that we now know or would like to know, upon what Mr. James would do or like to do, what environmental concerns might we have? We know that Mr. James has, cannot, cannot walk effectively. He's lost a uh, function of his right side of his body, but I want to present a different example. What if Mr. James could walk in and there was an opportunity to encourage him to increase to walk, you know, 30 minutes a day, three times a week or so, just around the neighborhood to help with his hypertension? But what if Mr. James said to you, my environment would not allow that. I'm afraid to walk in my neighborhood. How do we respond to that? And lastly, political economic just another dimension of influence that we must consider. Thinking again about Mr. James, how would we implement the plan? He doesn't really appear to want to go anywhere. He doesn't trust the people who would be a significant part of his care. So how would we implement the plan for Mr. James amidst his distrust of doctors, et cetera? But more importantly, oh, I shouldn't suggest more importantly, but certainly very important, we must ask ourselves, how would Mr. James know if the plan worked? If you're, if you're anything like me, having practiced nursing for some time, we become driven by our perception of what should be. We establish these plans and these goals, and this is what should be, and this is what 
improved health looks like. But is that most effective, or would that approach be most effective for Mr. James? I don't know. Maybe in our insistence upon what should be, he disengages and becomes more distrusting, not only of doctors, but now of the nurse that's provided care for him. So many, many questions, and I really I, I present this and I pose this because it's a reminder of, again, the complexities of faith and community and nursing. I recently shared with an individual that one of the things that I love most about nursing is our focus upon patient response to illness. Yes, we've got to deal with illness, but our intentionality focuses around how the patient responds to illness, how we support and comfort and provide for the patient. And sometimes I feel that gets a little lost. And it's certainly my hope that this tree of life model of faith-based living returns us to a place where we truly consider patient first, even their spirituality or what we might describe as a lack thereof. People find themselves in different places and spaces. How do we as nurses validate that, recognize that, and embrace that as part of their care? I mentioned earlier that this Tree of Life model has certainly been published, and you can find a reference to it here. And there's actually a link provided that uh, can be shared with you later should you uh, reach out and desire to, to access it. But I, it's, it's open source, so you can actually Google it if you desire and read more about the, the Tree of Life model of faith-based living. I do want to suggest to you that as a conceptual model, the tree of life is, is open, if you will, or available to be tested per different theories. And I welcome the opportunity for persons who have subscribed to different theoretical approaches to nursing to collaborate. Let's consider how that theory can be worked through this uh, practice model in an effort to better serve the communities in which we find ourselves. Well, we wanted to entertain, leave a little time to entertain uh, questions, but I believe an opportunity would be available to you to email uh, the chapter also if questions are not able to be facilitated this evening. We um, have one question in the uh, chat now. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Uh, okay. See, okay, see, it seems your faith-based model is very timely for its use during the current COVID-19 situation. How could you use it to address the current disparities that have been identified? Oh, wow, that, that is certainly an excellent question. And I will say, much like nursing care and health care, there is no simple answer, if I can say that. Uh, but, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up and address a couple of slides if I can, to answer your question. No, bless Jesus. Okay, so given our current COVID-19 situation, this pandemic, I think we have to first pause and, and look at the, there's the soil, right? The earth, community. How do we come to understand community now? And I think we would have to meet a very, uh, we'd have to meet every person. And Michelle, I'm going to minimize the chat because there's comments. Okay. Right. It kind of throws uh, as we enter, engage every patient, we've got to back up and we've got to say, okay, what does the community look like now? And meet that person, if, if I'm very honest with you, I think a first approach in using this model to provide care is to be very realistic and real and understanding that we've got to meet people spiritually first, wherever they are spiritually, and come to assess their spiritual needs, which would include every dimension of influence, because if you will consider how we live out our spirituality, every political, economic, environmental, social, cultural, psychological, and biologically, everything impacts how we experience our spirituality, our sense of faith and belief and connection to something greater. And while I, I won't go down the mental health discussion today, I think we could all agree to some extent that um, 
mental health is significantly impacted by how one experiences spirituality, finding connection uh, in a greater sense, in a greater way. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate your question, and can I provide it? Yes, I can. The next question, if you will, and I hope that I've at least begun to answer your question, uh, Dr. Benson, great question. I will say this, and I'm going to the next question. You talk about current disparities. That's a big conversation by itself. <laughs> so I hope I've laid some foundation at least to begin. But again, it's a faith-based living, so let's start there. Um, the next question, what are your future plans for the continued development of your model? Again, thank you for that question. Um, what I'd like to do, honestly, is to identify persons, or even myself, that subscribe to certain theoretical approaches to nursing care and walk those theories through this model to see how they work. Again, if you look at many nursing theories, most, if not all, don't directly, they may address spirituality because that's a component of nursing care, but don't necessarily and directly speak to, um, to faith. So continued development, walking some theories through the model, uh, providing the model as a means for persons to build their practice and testing if the theories in the model actually works to produce uh, greater spiritual health in addition to physical health. And I suggest to you, I'm not much of an artist, I'd like to see <laughs> the image better developed. Um, but great question, and I hope certainly that I've spoken to that. Um, okay. There's a question, can you provide an example of using the political economic influence uh, with the nursing process with Mr. James? I don't hear much about this. Oh, that's, enough. that's a great question. And what I will share before I kind of respond to that, that one has to uh, recognize that there are certain sensitivities around how one defines political, political economic influence. And because this is a dimension of influence, it really matters most how factors are filtered into and through Mr. James or whomever the patient may be. So this is not about uh, making any political or economic statements or assertions. It's understanding what Mr. James, if you will, how he influences, I'm sorry, how he interprets political economic uh, influence. So I'll, I'll give this example, let's, let's consider the, the multiple illnesses he has and his distrust of doctors and so forth. Um, ooh, that's, I'll, I'll try to walk carefully <laughs> uh, because there, I'm just going to say, I'll just speak candidly, okay? So one has to consider how uh, Mr. James views uh, political discourse how Mr. James views and understands how politics and economy have come together. You know, we talked about this model accommodating or making room for the nurse to consider uh, cultural nuances, but not only cultural nuances, we've got to also look at demographic uh, realities. Uh, if we were to look at communities that traditionally look like our uh, uh, composed uh, of uh, persons who look like Mr. James, there is a historical context that would suggest political economic um, actions were taken to contribute to his current health status. Uh, now that's a lot to unpack, and I do realize that. And honestly, if we're going to engage in faith-based living, faith-based practice, and true care, it gets uncomfortable. But giving an example, Let's do that. So Mr. James does not trust the doctors. Uh, his family is unable to, act to, to get to him. So that might put him in a position to where access becomes a significant concern for him. And if Mr. James were to live in a community uh, where, uh, well, I'd ask your community, who, who, just consider your community. And Mr. James were to say to you, uh, 
you know, I would have better provisions if I had health care, if I had insurance. And the discussion became about how insurance is or is not available. Do you go to Mr. James and argue? Or do you recognize what he believes and then you step up and you say, but here are the resources. Here is how we can make the most of that. Um, you always ask some very heavy questions and, and I apologize, I'm always the one looking at the clock and I realize where we are. Uh, but thank you for the question. Uh, but I certainly uh, enjoy sharing this evening and I too look forward to continuing to share and publish. And again, if there's anyone who says, you know, I believe firmly in this theory of these practices, or if I'm honest, I think the theory would be great as to just prompt further discussions and how we assess what's going on in our communities and the lives of our patients. Uh, I want to return to, to Dr. Benson's question about current disparities. How do we define disparities? And I think the model gives us an opportunity to really break that down. If we look at the soil, which is the community, then we get an opportunity to look at every activity of living. We get to look at maintaining a safe environment. And with that singular activity of living, we can then work with a Mr. James or a patient or a community and ask, what are the biological implications? What are the psychological implications of maintaining a safe environment? If you live in, uh, you know, pre-COVID, there were some very sick uh, some communities in our country where gun violence is very prevalent. Well, psychologically, what impact does that have upon you? And how does that affect your health? And if maintaining a safe environment is a challenge, again, we're going to choose at least two activities of living to guide our assessment. Well, then let's double back around and find something that's a strength. If maintaining the safe environment is a weakness in the care of this particular patient, let's find a strength. And maybe that strength is personal cleansing and dressing. I just pulled that one out of, the, out of the air there. And that person finds great comfort in their ability to care for themselves. Well, how do we work on that? How do we build that? Um, again, great questions. Thank you all. And I, I certainly hope I've been able to provide answers uh, for you and look forward to further dialogue. Michelle, what do we suggest to attendees as far as uh, reaching out to us with additional questions or uh, support needs? Um, well, you can actually put your email address in the chat, and they are welcome to email you directly. Okay, and I'll voice that email. It's marcus.gault, M-A-R dot G-A-U-T at W-G-U dot E-D-U, marcus.gault at W-G-U dot E-D-U, and I certainly hope to hear from you. We appreciate everyone who attended tonight and all your great questions. Uh, the presentation, Marcus, was wonderful. I've learned so much, and it just gave me a new perspective on our nursing care. And I feel like everybody here probably gained that same knowledge tonight, and we really appreciate it. It was a great presentation, and we appreciate everyone who attended. Well, thank you. Y'all have a good night.